Good evening, and welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Isabel Lilias, and I'm one of the Ath Fellows this year. Corruption is an epidemic that plagues societies all around the world, regardless of geographical location, GDP, or type of government. Corruption is not just a bad deed done by a handful of selfish people. It is an issue so configured into our institutions that it bleeds through all parts of the system, incurring tremendous economic, social, and political costs. It fosters all the things that make societies unhealthy and unstable, including distrust, violence, and civil strife. But with corruption prevailing in even the upper echelons of our institutions that are meant to protect and build a better society, whose job is it to cure this epidemic? Our speaker tonight will discuss what drives corruption, why it matters, and how the International Monetary Fund combats it through its reform efforts. Sean Hagen is general counsel and director of the legal department at the International Monetary Fund. In this capacity, Mr. Hagen advises the fund's management, executive board, and membership on all legal aspects of the fund's operations, including its regulatory, advisory, and lending functions. Mr. Hagen has published extensively on both the law of the fund and a broad range of legal issues relating to the prevention and resolution of financial crisis, with a particular emphasis on insolvency and the restructuring of debt, including sovereign debt. Prior to his tenure at the IMF, Mr. Hagen was in private practice, first in New York and subsequently in Tokyo. He received his Juris Doctor from the Georgetown University Law Center and also received a Master's of Science in International Political Economy from the London School of Economics and Political Science. As always, I must remind you that audio and visual recording is strictly prohibited. Please silence and put away your mobile devices at this time. And along with our moderator for this evening, President of Claremont McKenna College, Hiram Chodosh, please join me in welcoming Sean Hagen to the Athenaeum. Have a seat. Thank you. Sean, it's great to have you. How does it feel to be in an academic environment after you know, getting out of the office and it off feels airplane. great. It's really great to be here, and it's great to be doing this with you. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. So let's start on the personal front. I know our students are always interested in what makes Sean Hagen a Sean Hagen. What What are the describe one or two special inflection points way before you got involved with the fund? Uh, this is your twenty seventh, twenty eighth year. Twenty eighth year. Um, what What happened in your life that was so critical? for you as a special growth moment to get to where you are today? So I took a couple of relatively unorthodox decisions that really shaped my career. Um, I was a history major. Um, and uh, when I was studying periods of history, I was interested in, in economics. I had this interest in economics. Funnily enough, I'm really quite poor at math. But for some reason, I still liked economics. And when I went to law school, I was finding myself fascinated by the intersection of public policy, economics, and the law. But I really didn't know how to translate that into a career in any concrete way. So I decided to do something which my friends at the time thought was crazy. I took a year off from law school and went to the LSE to study not law, but actually international political economy. And it meant that I didn't graduate with my peers. So it was, it was a difficult decision. But it was a good decision for me uh, because it, it, it was a decision that I made at the right stage in my own intellectual exploration. And it convinced me that I wanted to work in the international area and for in an international organization. I would not have done that without that year. A second inflection point came a couple of years later. Again, it was an unorthodox decision. I, even though I wanted to work for an international organization, they weren't really that interested in me. Uh, and because to be hired as a lawyer in these institutions, you needed to have some experience. I had no experience. So they want you to work for a law firm, three or four years at a law mm -hmm. firm. So I decided, OK, I'll go to a law firm. Well, I moved to New York, and I was a first-year associate. And Hiram, you've done this. You know, you work a lot of pressure, but you work on a very small piece of a very complex transaction. 
and it can be a little bit frustrating. Then I decided to do, again, something that my friends thought was crazy. I took a job working for a Japanese law firm in Tokyo. And uh, I was the only foreigner in the firm. How was your Japanese at the time? It was pretty bad. <laughs> uh, but, but I tell you, what's interesting is that um, English is the international language of business, and therefore you are negotiating. It could be a transaction between a Japanese company and a German company. Everything would be in English. So I, I decided to take it, and I moved to Japan for three years, and it was a wonderful professional experience because, you know, Japan at the time was in some respects the way China is now. It was the economic heavyweight. So I did a lot of mergers and acquisitions work. You know, w I was given responsibility that I would never have received mm -hmm. in New York. Sometimes I, I thought they must be crazy to give me this responsibility because I didn't really know what to do. But, but I learned on the job. And uh, the other thing about it, personally, it was a wonderful experience. I don't know if any of you have been to Japan. It's a great culture. It's a very different culture. It's, it's, it's very, very different from anything that I have experienced. I lived in Asia before, but Japan was very different. I became fascinated by the language and actually asked my firm to allow me to take three months off, and I lived in a fishing village with a Japanese family, learning Japanese. And ironically, as, as I told you, I had done all of this to work for an international organization, an opening came up at the IMF. And ironically, it was because of my Japanese experience that I got the job. So, you know, the lesson that I took for myself was that sometimes it's, it's, it's worth taking a risk. It's worth basically, you know, making an unorthodox decision like that. It's, it certainly has helped me. So math did not affect his career, right? His fear of math. <laughs> it and, affected many other and, things, but not my career. And w we always talk about lateral thinking, but here we have lateral action, right? W he takes off to a fishing village so he can improve his Japanese and take the national exam. And that becomes the unexpected reason exactly. or trigger for entry yeah. in the kind of career that you wanted yeah. to have. So, yeah. so set the stage for us. Um, when I was in college, I didn't know the difference between the IMF and the World Bank. Our students, I know, have a great grounding in international organizations. But tell us a little bit about the charter of the IMF. Sure. What's it there to do? And then I want to get into why is it focused on corruption? Sure. So. Um, Revealing my historical interests, let me try to put it in historical context. So the IMF, like the World Bank, like the UN, was established at the end of the Second World War. And actually at that time really was an explosion in international public law, which is the, the law that governs relations between sovereign states. And the reason why it was an explosion was because, you know, countries were willing to pool sovereignty in those days. And they were willing to pull sovereignty because they had been pulling sovereignty during the war. I mean, as allies, they had been on the battlefield together. And they were convinced that there needed to be a pooling of sovereignty to basically prevent the type of national sort of behavior that had existed during the 30s that had led to the war. Mm -hmm. These are individuals who were convinced that unless they took bold action, that would happen. So there were two aspects of the system that they created that were, are important to understand for purposes of understanding the IMF. The first was that it wasn't just the creation of international obligations, but the creation of institutions. So these institutions became subjects of international law. And they, were, they had staffs that were independent from the states. And they, these institutions were charged with monitoring the observance of these obligations. The second aspect of this architecture was they decided, let's create specialized institutions. They could have come up with one, the world organization. They decided, no, no. Let's have organizations that are focused exclusively on political problems, the UN, and then the IMF on economic. And that s concept of a specialized agency has persisted. And in the IMF's case, what they wanted to do was establish obligations of members that would prevent the type of 
na economic nationalism that had existed in the 30s. And you may remember that the depression in the, th in the 30s was exacerbated by competitive devaluation of your currency, which allows your products to become more favorable in terms of price. That's one way of making, promoting exports is to depreciate your currency. So they created a fixed exchange rate system to prevent that. And this was the code of conduct. But what's interesting it was that the IMF was charged with monitoring it. You could only change your exchange rate with the permission of the fund. So the IMF, when it was set up, was primarily a regulatory institution. And that system lasted until 1971, when the fixed exchange rate system came to an end, and countries were given the freedom to float their exchange rates. And one could have argued that maybe the fund should have gone out of business. In fact, I have a friend who, when I joined, said that he joined the fund in 1971, and he wrote the letter, he got the offer just before the float, and when the float occurred, he had to write to HR asking whether he still had a job because he thought the IMF was going out of business. But what happened was the IMF found a new lease on life, not through its regulatory function, but through its financial powers. Because the IMF had large amounts of resources that it provided to countries that were having debt problems. Now, in, in the 50s, 60s, there weren't significant debt problems because the only finance around was public debt. Governments would lend to each other. But from the 1970s onwards, there was the explosion of private capital markets where individuals and corporations in one country looking for a higher rate of return were lending money to emerging markets who were looking for savings from other countries because they didn't have enough of their own to make investments, which is a great idea. It's very efficient. It, allows, it allowed many, many emerging markets to develop their capacity. But like everything else, you can have too much of a good thing. Mm -hmm. And countries would overborrow, and lenders would not realize when they would, should stop lending. And suddenly, these countries could not repay their debt. And the IMF created a role for itself, I think that's the only word I can use, during the Latin American debt crisis, where it essentially brokered solutions between these sovereign countries in Latin America, starting with Mexico, and the private lenders. And what it did was it would lend a significant amount of money to these countries, but in exchange for them, taking the reform actions that were necessary to fix the underlying problem. And in exchange for that, the private lenders would reschedule the debt. It became known as the catalytic role that we would play. Our, our analysis of the problems, our endorsement of the program, plus our money, would allow a country to regain access to the private markets. And that's essentially been what we have been doing for the last 50, 60 years. So, so you had pooling of sovereignty. You had, at one point, the globalization of capital yep. transfer. You have this uh, unwitting interdependence. And then you need an arbiter to come in and help people work out when right. things go bust. Now, how does that relate to corruption? It, is it that corruption was considered just a kind of domestic issue? And because of the greater global interdependence of our economies, all of a sudden corruption itself rises to a level of international significance? Is that what explains uh, the massive attention to corruption, say, from the late 90s? Okay. So inherent in the fund's establishment is the concept that when one country basically adopts and implements policies, there's a potential spillover effect on other countries. That's the underlying assumption. And of course, that interdependency has just gone through a multiplier you know, over the years, right? And one of the major concerns that the fund has had for a while is that when you look at policies that make a real difference, what you want to do is to have countries that are adopting policies that 
what we call our sustainable inclusive growth. Not explosive growth that can create volatility, but sustainable inclusive growth. And the word inclusive meaning growth that basically does not create excessive inequality. Because inequality in and of itself, it's not a moral position we're taking. We're just making the observation that excessive inequality leads to instability. So we look at a number of factors that lead to sustainable inclusive growth that creates stability in the country and therefore it avoids adverse spillover effects. And over the last 15, 20 years, we've looked at a number of factors that influence sustainable inclusive growth. And one of them is corruption. Why is that? So let's, talk, let's unpack it a little bit. We're not talking about, you know, occasional transactions or even high-level transactions. We're talking about where corruption has become systemic in the economy, where it becomes, it's no longer the exception to the norm. It is actually the norm itself of behavior. And when it's embedded, it has a profound effect on sustainable inclusive growth. For example, one of the state's principal obligations is to raise money and spend it, okay? When corruption is systemic, it completely debilitates that capacity. Tax administration. Mm -hmm. When you have essentially complicity between the tax collector, uh, collectors and wealthy tax payers, and they don't pay their taxes, it delegitimizes the entire tax system. Mm -hmm. I've been in countries where I am in a cab and I ask the cab driver, do you pay your taxes? And he looks at me in the rear view mirror. You expect me to pay my taxes? All these wealthy businessmen, they don't pay their taxes. Why should I pay my taxes? Mm -hmm. And of course, that creates incredible fiscal vulnerability and instability that can lead to debt crisis. One example. But it's even worse on the expenditure side mm -hmm. because it distorts the, ex the expenditure decisions. Instead of a state spending money on the types of things that we know are critical for sustainable growth, education, health, they'll spend it on a fancy new conference center that generates kickbacks. So you can see it, it distorts expenditures, and there are a num the, some of the most corrupt countries have massive overcapacity in infrastructure because that's the way you generate kickbacks. Another area is investment. One of the major responsibilities of any state is to attract and regulate investment. But if corruption is systemic, it is a major, ta it's a tax on investment, right? It's an, extra, mm -hmm. it's an extra cost, but it's even worse, it creates so much uncertainty that it will actually deter investment. I know, and you know, there is this myth that CEOs say, well, you know, the only thing worse than an inefficient, corrupt government is a clean, inefficient, corrupt government, because at least with corruption, you can get things going. When you talk, to major CEOs, you realize that that's rubbish. They do not want a situation where they invest a large amount of money in an oil refinery, for example, in a country, which is a huge capital injection, only to know that they might be subject to extortion for kickbacks throughout the life of the country, of the company. They would much prefer to invest in a, in a country that might be a bit more expensive, but where they have predictability in operations. And there's a lot of empirical evidence that shows, Hiram, the extent to which systemic corruption basically reduces both domestic resource mobilization, but also uh, foreign investment. Final point I would make, which is perhaps the most relevant for this group, is it has, an, it has a debilitating impact on the youth. Because when corruption is systemic, it really undermines 
the incentive to get a good education. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because it matters less what you know, it matters who you know. If you're living in a corrupt country, everything is based on relationships. Merit is less important. So it reduces the incentives for younger people to get education. And there was a survey done about three years ago, and they asked the youth around the world what they saw as being the single biggest problem. And they ranked corruption ahead of poverty because they were wise enough to realize that corruption actually for many countries is the cause of poverty. Right. And it's not only the role that people play in society, it's actually getting access to education, which itself exactly. often is an opportunity for someone to extract their rent. Exactly, and it, it, this is the point. It exacerbates inequality because the people who normally are the most vulnerable, who depend on services so they can get that leg up, they don't get that because the money is being spelt else, spent elsewhere. So when you look at the alternative theories for what drives it, what causes it, uh, you have everything from the political theory, a basic power corrupts, and it's all about the concentration and monopoly of power, and the bargaining ability of people not to be able to overcome that. You have economic theories of just risk benefit, um, and then you have ethical theories. Um, in your work, in trying to just understand what drives it, what causes it, what primary framework do you think the IMF uses, or do you use professionally to understand its underlying causes? So here is where we try to be pragmatic and humble, which is I've read a lot of the literature that you've mentioned, and I think you could have an endless debate about what the anthropological and social causes are for corruption. And I think there's a lot of truth in many of them. For the fund, where we've reached a consensus that this is a huge barrier for countries, the question is, okay, what do we do about it? And, you know, it's, it's, really, it's really a complicated issue, and, you know, it's really important that you approach it with humility. Let me just share some observations with you. The first thing, is, and this was something that was said by somebody else, which is that, you know, corruption is a crime of calculation. It's not a crime of passion. So what you need to do is to change the incentive structure, okay? So from a lawyer's perspective, you naturally think of, well, what's the most important incentive that you need to bring to bear to stop corruption? And look, we haven't talked about this, Hiram, but you know, one of the questions is, what is the definition of corruption? Because mm -hmm. you can have a right. long discussion on this. And to be simple, you know, corruption, everybody accepts the idea that it's the abuse of public office for private gain, right? And the abuse can range from a broad variety, we were talking about this with the students uh, over dinner, it can be, you know, ethical, but everybody agrees that criminal activity is corruption at a minimum. We're talking about bribery, embezzlement, people understand that as corruption. Well, the best way to address this issue is to have a credible threat of prosecution. People understand that and will react to that. And I have to tell you, when I started getting, when I first got into this work as a lawyer, I kind of reached for that lever. I have learned that this is you need to have that, but you can't over-rely on this. Why? First of all, if you rely excessively on putting people in jail, there is a risk that an anti-corruption strategy just becomes a political strategy. And it's the current administration putting the previous administration in jail. So I have realized that while you need to have a credible threat of prosecution. You need to have a broader regulatory and institutional reform that creates other incentives for good behavior. Let's just go back to the crime of calculation view. This yeah. is the economic theory of corruption. And 
uh, one of the things that I, that I observe when I was doing some work with you in Indonesia is that often people don't understand how coercive um, the practice of corruption can be when organized crime is involved. So you'll recall that the first judge to, to, to take Tommy Saharta to trial and to convict him was killed. Mm. And Tommy Saharta was later convicted for that murder. Yeah. And so it really struck me that we think about it as a, a sort of you know, a blank slate of calculation when actually the refusal to participate in a bribe can uh, leave someone vulnerable Absolutely. to violence. That's one. Second, on the, you know, the extreme repressive approach to corruption, the other problem in addition to the abuse, because that is a common narrative, right? You know, country, you know, new regime comes in, puts a bunch of people in jail because what? Because they're corrupt. The larger problem is that when you create such high stakes for corrupt activity, you risk corrupting the process to yes. hold someone corrupt exactly. because you know money will talk yeah so this is something that's always puzzled me though like if we don't really have to understand the underlying causes what explains again in the case of indonesia someone we worked with refused a two hundred thousand dollar bribe in one of the first bankruptcy supreme court appeals refused it why like, what was it? What was that ethical threshold that that judge had reached that maybe many others in, in Indonesia who had been under Saharta's thumb were incapable of? Yeah. Well, I, I don't know what it was, but I don't think it was because he felt that there was a, a threat right. of a sanction. Right. It was an internal one. It was an internal one. And so, so, so the question is, I mean, and, and this is, I have come to the conclusion that at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is create institutions in as much as we're trying to create civil service that actually is proud of being sort of independent from both private influence and public interference. Yeah. So, so in a positive norms rather than in terms of negative incentives. So this is a very pragmatic approach to say, gosh, we don't really understand nearly enough. Uh, and we're not going to spend a lot of our energy trying to understand it. We're going to just treat it as a phenomenon. Yep. Okay, so now what are the approaches to this phenomenon? So let's go back to your tax example. Yep. People will not pay taxes if they think their neighbors are not paying taxes, even you know the very wealthy especially. People will pay taxes if they think people around them are paying taxes. People will you know, engage in corrupt activity, petty, petty corruption, petty bribes, if they think everybody else is doing. So from a fund perspective, as you think about this in terms of governmental authority or the private sector trying to influence and interfere with impartial decision making, what are the primary strategies for turning that around? Okay. One of the critical ones is leadership or individuals. You mentioned the, the judge. Um, we're on Indonesia a lot, but there are other countries where this has happened where you have somebody coming in who is willing to take the risk to shake up the system. Um, in, in Indonesia, for example, there is uh, a former minister of finance, uh, Sri Mulyani Indrawati, who I knew very well. She became the minister of finance. She had been in a, uh, an NGO for many years. She arrived in the ministry and essentially made it very clear that there was going to be zero tolerance. And that ministry was one of the most corrupt in part because there were excessive rents and bribes in the customs administration. So she fired, she fired everybody. She didn't prosecute anybody, but she fired everybody in that unit. And she made it clear that there was zero tolerance for corruption. She also reached out to the private sector and said, look, I know the reason why you've been bribing customs officials because of the ineffectiveness of our customs administration. So we want to partner with you. We promise to basically streamline our regulatory framework to allow for more efficient customs administration as long as you commit not to bribe. And there was a list of companies who took the oath. And it's amazing, but 
corruption came down significantly. And, and so this is one of the things I want to hit. hit. You have to realize you can't approach this issue exclusively by looking at the demand side. You've also got to look at the supply side. In other words, for every bribe that is taken, one is offered. So you have to also look at finding ways to discourage the offering of, of bribes and also finding a way of avoiding, because this is a big problem, Iram, a lot of corrupt officials want to conceal the proceeds of their corruption. And they use accounts in many advanced economies, including the United States, to conceal their wealth. So there's efforts that needs to be taken in countries like the United States to prevent that from happening. So at the, at the lower levels of the civil service, though, did she also have to change the whole approach to HR, to yes. performance culture? Because frankly, in a lot of societies, public officials, it's the only way for them to put bread on the table. Uh, I was doing some work with uh, the Attorney General's office in, in uh, Afghanistan, and you know, a, a prosecutor uh, in Kabul was making just over poverty wages. There's just no way to survive without actually taking a tip. Actually, it was like a bar. It went into a jar, and then it was shared equally with the office. And economically speaking, there's not that much of a difference between that tip and paying a fee, exactly. a license fee. So it could have been legalized, brought above the table, right? Yeah. So, so, so you have to deal with the people who are working, uh, particularly at the lower levels of civil service, to make sure that there's a performance culture and also that they can actually make a wage to, to be able to raise a family. Absolutely. So a major element of any anti-corruption strategy is to basically address compensation in the civil service. Um, and there are a number of examples of where that has played a central role. One country in particular where is, is, is where the issue of leadership and compensation played an important role is Singapore. Um, you know, Singapore, when it was part of Malaysia, was one of the most corrupt regions in the world. Lee Kuan Yew comes to power, and he introduced a sort of zero-tolerance anti-corruption strategy. It had a number of elements. It had a repressive element. Mm -hmm. There was strict penalties. He also, there was a leadership quality. He, was, he had an incredibly frugal lifestyle, and he basically made it clear that if you wanted to succeed, you had to replicate that. But the third thing is that he dramatically increased, dramatically increased salaries in the public service. And he would say, yes, the public servants in Singapore are well paid, but they are not rich like public servants in other countries. Mm -hmm. So I agree with you. I mean, there was a major reform in Georgia recently also where they essentially dismissed a significant portion of the police and the prosecutors, but in the same time, increased the salary significantly. So we've got leadership, we've got zero tolerance, we've got looking at both sides of the equation. What else? Uh, tell us a little bit about the efforts to grow more transparency. Yeah. So um, this is a, a, an important component because when you think about where the opportunities for corruption are, they are when a public official has the power to grant a permit or a license. Well, that power exists in a significant way in an over-regulated economy. And in fact, in some countries, excessive regulation is there because it provides an opportunity for rent seeking. Mm -hmm. Now, the solution isn't deregulation, right? I mean, we're not talking about, nor is it getting rid of discretion. I mean, you need to have discretion in key areas, whether it's, you know, bank resolution, bank supervision, whatever. But there is a real benefit of streamlining regulation, and in particular, and this is one of the big promises of technology, of using technology to create transparency in the exercise of discretion. For example, 
We talked about a customs official in Indonesia. Now you can do your customs applications online. You don't have a middle person who's going to use that as an opportunity to extract rent. So the regulatory reform piece to this is a huge part of the solution. Mm -hmm. So when the IMF talks anti-corruption, um, does it help or hurt internal anti-corruption efforts? I mean, the, the fund is a controversial institution in a lot of the world. And so tell us a little bit about the political dynamics of an IMF agenda in a location that may not have the greatest view of the IMF. Yeah, so that's, that's a good point. So there's two, there's two elements to this. I, I mentioned that we have a regulatory and a financial role. So the regulatory role changed with the collapse of the fixed exchange rate system, but we continue to do something which is called the Article 4. The Article 4 is countries, all countries, are required to basically be audited by the IMF every year. And that means we do an analysis of their economy, what policies are supporting sustainable inclusive growth, and which ones are not. And that includes the United States, it includes emerging markets. Remember, the IMF is not a development institution. Okay? Mm -hmm. So it is an institution that basically provides policy recommendations to all countries. So in the context of that regulatory, we, we will assess whether or not there's a corruption problem. And if there is, we will give our views as to how severe it is, how it's impacting, and that will be published. The country may like it or may not like it, but it's too bad because that's mm -hmm. part of our regulatory function. Where it gets more complicated is when we're wearing our financial hat. There are countries coming to us asking for assistance, and there we are being a bit more intrusive. We're saying in order for you to receive our money, you're going to have to introduce reforms. This is the conditionality that is often controversial. Mm -hmm. My own experience is that often when we are intervening, particularly in a crisis, it's not the IMF agenda versus a country's agenda. Rather, it's the IMF coming into a country that's in a crisis and there are important reform elements in that country that have been asking for reforms for an extended period of time and see the crisis as an opportunity to basically break through vested interests in the status quo. Because mm -hmm. often what blocks change is vested interest, vested economic interests. And corruption is a huge barrier in that respect. Mm -hmm. So often the ones that are asking for our programs to have this element or that element are in fact civil society or others in that economy that are basically making the difference. Mm -hmm. So it is, that doesn't mean it's not sensitive. I, all I would say also is that people are willing to, to talk about this openly now. 20 years ago, you wouldn't even use the word corruption, you would use the word governance. Mm -hmm. Now people are willing to talk about it because I think people recognize that it's as problematic as in, it is. In your experience, when you've, in some ways, partnered with internal groups yep. or individuals, what comes to mind as the most promising sector that you've worked with that has really driven change from within? It's a great question. So you, mem you remember, Hiram, we, when we were, so Hiram and I did some work together in Indonesia a number of years back, and, and um, there was, uh, we, we created an anti-corruption commission. And the reason why we created this was because we couldn't rely on the police because they were corrupt. We couldn't rely on the prosecutors because they were corrupt. And we couldn't rely on the court system because it was corrupt. So we had to create a self-contained investigative, prosecutorial, and judicial body anti-corruption commission. Now, the problem with this, and actually, the, and it, it received a lot of support from society. The problem was 
So you create this on paper, but why is it going to be any different? And the difference was, and this is what I think was critical for the reform in Indonesia, and, and I think in Indonesia has made a lot of progress, was that civil society, the NGOs that had been throwing stones regularly at the government because it was corrupt, decided that they were going to take a risk and take leadership positions in these, in these new institutions. And they did. And now the Anti-Corruption Commission in, in Indonesia is extremely intrusive. I, I mean, you'll sharpen my memory of it, but as I remember it, it was a bunch of 25 and 26-year-olds. Some of them were. I mean, they were really outstanding. I mean, absolutely fearless yeah, in yeah, terms of what yeah. they would take on. Yeah. And extremely technically effective. Yep. And the same thing is going on right now in the Ukraine, where we have another significant anti-corruption program in place, and it's civil society. In fact, one of the things that we really pointed out, and to the point where we actually held up our financing for this specific issue is we wanted to ensure that the law required civil society to play a role in the selection of the individuals who would actually be appointed to the Anti-Corruption Commission. Mm -hmm. So w one last question before we open it up. So I remember when we were working together in Indonesia, the IMF's role in judicial reform was controversial yeah. because that belonged to the World Bank. Yeah. And so you've always struck me as someone who really takes stock of the institutional context in which you're working. And obviously the IMF is not alone in working on anti-corruption. So reflect a little bit on your competitors or <laughs> your partners, um, the other institutions that are trying to get into the same space in various ways and how much of a coordination and political challenge that can be. Yeah, it is. It, it is, it is, it's a challenge not necessarily because we're competitors, but because we operate with different constraints. In other words, in the fund, we are in a crisis mode where countries are desperately trying to regain the confidence of the capital markets. And they need to basically show that they are, they're serious about what they're doing. Even if it takes a while to implement, they're serious about what they're doing. So we tend to, how can I put this? We tend to operate in the fund with a, a degree of discipline and focus. The bank basically is a development institution. It has a very long time frame. And therefore, the gestation period for many of their projects is very long. The key to success is, in terms of partnering, is where we come in, we identify where the weaknesses are, we basically provide leadership in the design, but let the bank take the lead in implementation because they're the ones who have, I mean, for example, in many of these countries, the IMF may have an office of one or two people. The bank has an office of 100 people. It's true that the amount of money that we're bringing to the table vastly outstrips the bank in terms of we're helping the, the whole country stay afloat while the bank is just doing specific projects. But the bank's institutional long-term investment is critical to success. So one of the things that we're doing more and more now is actually partnering with the bank and the other regional development banks for them to essentially implement the type of re institutional and regulatory reform that I'm talking about. Fascinating. Well, let's open it up for some questions. Thank you. Please raise your hand if you have a question. As always, priority goes to students. <laughs> Thank you so much for your talk. Um, so you spoke a little bit about the temptation to pull kind of the effective prosecutorial threat lever a little bit, um, as, at least as far as the demand side goes for uh, bribes by public officials. Um, but at least in the United States, we have the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, yeah. 
I was wondering if you see that as an effective kind of supply side weapon um, for corrupt, I guess for, for the offering of bribes, um, and if you could opine a little bit about how that's affected your work at the IMF. Yeah, so um, actually the, in this area, the US was a leader. The Foreign Corrupt Practices Act was really um, the first comprehensive legislation enacted by an advanced country to criminalize the bribery of uh, foreign officials. And it, was, it really did set the standard, and it was followed by the OECD, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, creating an anti-bribery convention that kind of replicated it, and all OECD countries became signatories, and the OECD not only um, requires them to adopt the legislation, but they actually monitor the implementation. They actually monitor the extent to which countries like the United States are actually enforcing by through prosecution. So it's, it's a very, and the US took a leadership position. The area where there's room for improvement in the US is on the other end. I, I mentioned this, right? You've got the supply side, but then you've got the corrupt official who wants to park the money somewhere, not necessarily in his or her own country, but in a financial center. And there, there is a standard that's been adopted. It's called the Financial Action Task Force. It's the anti-money laundering thing. And there, I think there's a recognition that the US has got a ways to go. Why is that? Because, and this goes back to Hiram, to the issue of transparency. One of the best ways to prevent public officials from trying to conceal their money is to require the banks who are providing the services, a city bank in New York or whatever, to require whoever is sending the money to reveal who the real beneficial owner is, rather than a dummy company that's where the directors are like the lawyers who, you know, but to require the beneficial ownership disclosure. And there, the US has a ways to go. And it's not an issue primarily of federal law. It's an issue actually of state law, Delaware mm -hmm. and Wyoming, that basically I think there's a recognition, have a ways to go to require the type of transparency that's needed to allow for the prosecution of money laundering, which is what this is. So that's an area where I think um, more needs to be done. Uh, thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, as President Charles's last question sort of got to, you briefly spoke to the ways in which the IMF is working to cooperate with other international institutions uh, in different countries. Uh, I was curious if you could comment perhaps on efforts by primarily the Chinese, but other countries as well, to create perhaps competitor institutions to the IMF and its sister organizations in the international arena, and to try and sort of use those rather than what they see as Western institutions. Thank you. Yeah. So. We talked a little bit about you know, growing interdependence in the global economy. And it's not surprising that that interdependence occurs at different speeds. And that there are certain regions that integrate faster than others. And when a region integrates in a way that's at a certain point, they want to create their own institutions. And those institutions will basically you know, do a number of things. The Eurozone, for example, basically its own monetary policy and currency. Increasingly, those regions also want to have their own crisis institution that can provide financing like the fund in an environment. Why? Why is that? Because they can control the decision making. In the Eurozone, it means that, for example, with the current, uh, the emergency stability mechanism, which they want to translate into the European uh, uh, Monetary Fund, it means that the decisions ma are made by Eurozone countries. It does not include uh, the US or other countries voting on a European program. So it's understandable that when you have regional integration, there is a desire to set up mini IMFs. And for the fund's perspective, whatever we might think about it, we're not going to change that. 
So what we try to do is basically cooperate with these institutions in a way that basically helps them. I mean, for example, the Eurozone crisis was a, is a good example, where essentially the institutions had not been fully formed by the time of the Eurozone crisis, and the market did not have a great de deal of confidence in their ability to design conditionality. We came in because we had some credibility in that space. But over time, I would imagine, as these institutions continue to develop in the Eurozone, they will gain their own credibility and we will become less relevant. I think it's something that we have to accept. The same thing is happening, for example, in Southeast Asia with the Chiang Mai Initiative. Some of you may have heard of that, which is amongst the ASEAN, where they're pooling their financing to deal with potential crises. We, I think we, we accept that. They, it's interesting, these countries in Southeast Asia, they have this mechanism, but in order to activate it, you have to have a program with the IMF first. So we are, I think we will still be relevant. Perhaps our financial leverage will not be as strong as it has been, but I think we will always have a role. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, my question is about the, um, so you mentioned that is, if a state is in crisis, then the, uh, it has to meet certain um, requirements and conditions set by the IMF to be, ab to be able to be bailed out. Are these um, requirements like about institutional reforms to address the country's corruption, or is it like just like short term, once it meets the standards and then gets the funding to solve its crisis, and then when the IMF, IMF left, will it be able to switch back to the, right. to the old path of the way they're operating? Thank yeah, you. That's, that's, a, that's a great question, and it, it's, it's kind of more general. So when the IMF, when, when a country approaches the IMF, it's having what we refer to as a balance of payments crisis. And what we mean by that is that the foreign exchange that it earns from its exports in goods and services or that it gets from borrowing is not enough to pay for the imports that it wants or the money that it has to pay back. It doesn't have the hard currency. And what's, what's happened is that it's come to us because it used to be able to just refinance its debt. And suddenly, the banks are saying, no, no, we're not act we don't want to refinance you because we don't think you can pay back. So it comes to us, and what we recommend will depend on what we see as the source of the problem. So we don't have a one-size-fits-all conditionality. There's not a single computer program. In some cases, it's a question of the country actually having pretty good institutions, but they just went on a, a spending binge. And they have to cut back on their expenditures so they can make ends meet. Okay? In other countries, the balance of payments crisis isn't because they were spending too much, but because they were earning too little. Their economies were not sufficiently competitive. They weren't able to export enough. The conditionality there often involves deeper, more structural changes in the economy to make the economy more competitive. So the nature of the reform depends on the nature of the problem. And you know, some people refer to it as austerity, but the reality is, is that when countries come to us, they often have come to us as a last resort. So inevitably, they associate the IMF with that pain. In fact, in the Asian crisis, it was known as the IMF crisis. We were actually as identified as causing the crisis, when in fact what happened was they came to us, and the medicine that they had to take was painful. What we try to do is to get countries to come earlier on. But that doesn't mean that the IMF doesn't make mistakes, and we do. And the reason why we make mistakes is in part because we have to respond in a crisis where you have a limited amount of information, and you're often left with choosing between very bad policy options. And 
in retrospect, when everything is unfolded, you realize that fiscal policy was too tight. We should have basically let the exchange rate go a little bit more. There's a lot of ex post analysis that we do. We have an independent evaluation office that is excruciatingly critical of our programs when we get it wrong. All I would try to say is we're pretty transparent about it. All of the IO reports are published, and it's probably our harshest critic. And we try to learn from the last crisis. The problem with crises is that they're never the same. <laughs> so often we learn the wrong lessons. But I, I do believe we're getting better at it. Uh, thanks for your talk. So you said that the IMF kind of acts as a lender of last resort and says that, oh, hey, they undertake these reforms, and in return, we'll push back the private debt schedules or something of the sort. Yeah. Recently, banks have a new option, right? Uh, Paul Singer's Elliott Capital Management came in and told a bunch of banks that, hey, give me your bank. I'll take on your debts. And uh, they have a new recourse mechanism. They managed to get the US courts to say, hey, the Argentina government, you need to pay back what they demand, and only then can you pay back other debt holders. So given that that precedent has been set, how do you think the IMF would deal with vulture capitalism of that sort? Yeah. So, um, OK, this is, a, this is a great question. Um, so let's bring everybody else up to speed on it, because it's, it's important. So you know, we talked about the Latin American debt crisis, right? So Latin American debt crisis was, as painful as it was, there was a certain predictability about how to resolve it. Why is that? Because you had a sovereign country with a handful of banks. Mm -hmm. These banks were like Citibank, whatever, Chemical Bank. You know, some of these banks are gone now. But anyway, they had a long-term interest in negotiating with these countries and finding a solution because they had businesses in these countries. And they were also subject to the regulatory suasion of the United States. And the United States is one of our biggest shareholders. And so the IMF, the United States, were able to get agreements. So these debt reschedulings, these debt restructurings were relatively straightforward. What happened, however, was international finance moved on. And instead of sovereign borrowers borrowing from banks, Banks were cut out of the picture, and you had, they issued bonds. And that changed the dynamic fundamentally. Why is that? The classic one was Ar Argentina, which is where the, the vulture fund litigation started. Argentina basically had three or 400 different bond issuances in eight or nine jurisdictions and thousands of bondholders. And these bondholders, were not subject to any regulatory suasion. They had no long-term interest in these countries. They had one objective, and that's to maximize their value of their claim. And if that meant suing the country and playing hardball, as you just suggested, that's what they would do. So one of the huge challenges for the fund was how do we basically create a framework that allows debt to be restructured with these type of actors. And, and, and these vultures would buy the debt on the secondary market for like 20 cents on the dollar and then litigate against the sovereign. Now, some of the vultures were actually very constructive because if you bought it at 20, you're, you're going to be willing to do a deal at 40. So actually, some of them were able to play a very constructive role. But some of them would play hard roles. So we had a big debate in the, in the public sector for several years, back in the early 2000s. It's, it was one of the most sort of important periods of my own career, where we tried to reform the system to create a form of bankruptcy for sovereign debt. And the IMF put out a proposal where it would amend its own charter to replicate US bankruptcy. And as many of you know, this issue arises with companies as well in the United States, with vulture creditors. And the way you resolve it in bankruptcy is the law says that if you can get a majority of creditors, two-thirds, to agree on a deal, 
you can make it binding on everybody else. So you bind the vulture in. We propose to do something like that, and we drafted an amendment to the Articles of Agreement. But I mentioned to you 70 years ago there was a willingness to pool sovereignty. Well, no longer. So the US was not, would not accept that. What we did instead was we replicated these bankruptcy provisions, but through private contract. So the bond agreements themselves have these provisions. And one of the big questions that's going to arise in the next 20 years is whether or not private law is going to be an adequate substitute for what is a public law issue. And we will see over time. Um, so we touched on this, you touched on this a little bit um, in your answers to your previous questions, but my like very vague understanding of the IMF is, or how the IMF is funded is primarily through uh, this quota system and contributions from its member countries. Um, that being said, when the IMF decides who to loan to, is that process at all politicized or does it have to be politicized because of the member countries? And if not, what sort of benefits are member countries getting from contributing to the IMF? Okay, so yeah, so good question. So the IMF has a quota system. And what happens is when you become a member, so let's start, the members of the IMF are sovereign states, right? So when you become a member of the IMF, you're given a quota. And the quota is based on the size of your economy in the world economy. And that determines your voting rights, how much money you can borrow if you want it. So in some respects, the IMF is more like a corporation in terms of the, the, this idea of you know, your voting rights depends on how much money you put in. That's the way. It's not one country, one vote. Okay? And the US is the largest shareholder, about 17%. But we've done a lot of reforms. Right now, all the BRICS countries are actually the top 10 shareholders. So China is actually now number three, will soon become number two. So there is a sense that politically, at least, the IMF has gone through a transition in terms of ownership. And, and, and in some respects, this is a crisis that existed not only for the IMF, but also, for example, the UN, where you have the Security Council, you know, the veto, the permanent veto. The Security Council is criticized because the permanent veto is occupied by, really, the victors of World War II. And there's a sense that they knew to move on. I think the IMF is, in some respects, one of the most modern institutions in terms of governance because it's been able to shift voting power towards emerging markets. But your question is about not necessarily the distrib distribution of political power, but almost how you insulate it from the decision-making process. So in the fund, you really have two sources of legitimacy. One of them is the political legitimacy that we just described, that countries feel like they have a vote that represents their voice. You know, China feels like, hey, I am number three, soon to be number two in the IMF. That's appropriate. Therefore, this is an institution that's worth me devoting some energy to. But What's another source of legitimacy in the fund is the independence of the staff, which gives it its intellectual legitimacy. Because what happens at the fund is that even though a lot of the decisions are taken by the executive board, which is political, all the analytical work is done by the staff who owe an exclusive duty of loyalty to the fund. And the trick is to combine the two. If we just had the staff and we didn't have the board, we would just be a think tank. But because you have this board, and I, I, you know, one of the most difficult parts of my job is trying to keep the board and the staff in balance and to avoid staff decisions being politicized so that staff are basically trying to make their best case on the analytics rather than basically trying to second guess where the political is. It's a really difficult process, but I think that the two together, when they work effectively, actually make the institution work well. 
Hi, thank you again so much for coming to speak with us uh, tonight. You mentioned earlier that you hoped many countries would come before the IMF were the, the lender of last resort. So there's a whole <laughs> field dedicated to what kind of indicators show sovereign debt problems, but how do you uh, personally start to evaluate uh, a potential sovereign debt problem, be it foreign direct investment flight or credit rating agencies on sovereign debt? Where do you start to see those indicators kind of vary in what they tell you, yeah. um, and how does that inform your decision making? Yeah, it's, it's really tricky because um, so, if you were to talk about a company being insolvent, the way you measure that under most systems is you look at the value of the assets and the value of the liabilities. And you know a country is insolvent when the value of the liabilities exceed the assets. The problem with doing that in a sovereign <laughs> is that the assets are at least theoretically inexhaustible because the assets are the taxing power of the country. So theoretically, a sovereign can continue to tax and raise money. So the judgment as to whether or not a country is insolvent or is becoming insolvent is a judgment about how much a country can tax before it becomes counterproductive. What do I mean by counterproductive? Taxes. The, the, the revenue you get from taxing, if you tax too much, you destroy growth, and growth destroys your revenues. So it becomes actually counterproductive. So it's a judgment about the sustainability of the debt, the long-term sustainability of debt. And we've invested a lot of time and energy in coming up with models on sustainability. But at the end of the day, it's more of an art than a science. Sometimes we get it right, and sometimes we get it wrong. Thank you for the talk. Uh, early on, you talked about Article 4, which is like all the members of IMF have to accept to be audited once a year. And you, you make it public to the whole world, the results of what came out of the audit. And it's so crucial to some of the countries who get foreign investments uh, because they, if, they are, if they get good results on, on your publication, of course, they will get more investment in that country. So how effective is that audition, like the audit that you, you, that you do in those countries? Do you have officials there who do those audits? Or it's, on, it's uh, people who are there already who do the audits because like, there are countries that depend, or de their foreign like investment depend on those publications. Yeah. So I, it's a great question. I, I, I really believe that even though a lot of people focus about the fund as a crisis institution and the money, the point that you've raised is so critical because these audits that we do are about crisis prevention. In other words, basically raising flags at an earlier stage. And in some respects, the anti-corruption reform that we're doing now is designed as an example of increasing the effectiveness of these reports, okay? And it's not just corruption. In other words, if I could give you an example, one of the things that was quite difficult for us was just before the Arab Spring, we had done some Article 4s on some of these countries. And from the perspective of monetary policy, bank regulation, um, fiscal policy, the countries looked fine. But clearly there were some deeper structural problems, enormous sense of inequality, of exclusion in the society that we missed in the Article Four. So increasingly now the desire is not to just look when we do an Article 4, at some of the short-term, medium-term issues, but look at some of the long-term issues that can affect the viability of a country. Corruption is one of them, but inequality is another one. Another one is gender. The fund has done a lot of work on gender inequality, demonstrating the extent to which 
policies that don't support gender inclusion in the workplace can have a, an enormous impact on sustainable growth in the long term. One, I mean, for example, if you read our Article 4 for Japan, a lot of it is about promoting gender equality in Japan. We'll take one more question. Hi, um, thanks for speaking today. I had a question about uh, the monopolistic competition that you observe in certain countries. Um, I was wondering if you've ever seen situations where it's been a primary driver of corruption. Um, and particularly, how, how you go about measuring that, quantifying that, and then especially like prescribing a solution for a private sector problem, which seems kind of difficult to me. Okay, so there's, there's the private monopoly issue, and then there's what I call the cartels that are created through excessive regulation. The latter one is one where we are actively involved, where we basically, you know, because an excessive regulation often is for the benefit of certain industries that have an enormous amount of influence in the legislative bodies. You know, I can say this, for example, in Greece, one of the biggest problems in Greece in terms of making it a competitive economy was the extent to which it was excessively regulated in so many different areas, principally to avoid competition for the benefit of vested interests. That's something that we take on. Private monopolies that are basically the result of growth in industry is something which we traditionally have not looked at, but I can tell you it has become an emerging in, in issue, particularly in the tech industry, and particularly because we now have an emerging issue about tech companies that operate globally, but the, the public policy response in terms of dealing with monopolies are really not in sync, for example, between the United States and Europe. Google was subject to significant antitrust action in, in Europe, but not in the US. And the reason why we're concerned about that is that it may become a proxy fight in a type of investment trade war, where the US may feel that Europe is doing this because Google is an American company. And so the, I, one of the things that we are really interested in doing is to creating some harmonization as to the way different jurisdictions handle the issue of monopoly. And right now, I don't want to go into this in too much detail, but the, the, the antitrust objectives in the US in terms of policy right now are different from the, what they are in Europe, which takes a much more aggressive attitude about that. And so one of the questions is, in an interdependent world, we come back to Hiram's point about interdependence, we need to create greater harmonization because these companies operate globally, and therefore we need to find a global response. The IMF's done battle in Seattle before, but this question gives it a whole new meaning. So we're <laughs> gonna have Sean come back and talk to us about IMF versus Amazon, Boeing, and so forth. Well. Let's give all of you a hand for some superb questions and some great answers by Sean. Sean, thank you so much no, for coming. Fine.